A warm welcome to the GeoBIN seminar, Building Better with Tech, on Geospatial Technologies in Digital Construction. I, Ishita Ayer, would like to take this opportunity to formally welcome Colonel Dr. Father Abraham Vian, Vice Chancellor, Christ Redeemed to the University in his absentia, Dr. Father Joseph Sisi, Pro Vice Chancellor in his absentia, Dr. Father Benny Thomas, Director, School of Architecture and School of Engineering and Technology, in his absentia. Dr. Iron Rose, Dean, School of Engineering and Technology and School of Architecture, in his absentia. Dr. Anita Suchilan, Head of Department, School of Architecture. Dr. Raghunandan Kumar, Head of Department, Department of Civil Engineering. All the respected faculty members and students from the Architecture and the Civil Department. Before we begin, let's have a small silent prayer. Thank you. I would like to call upon Dr. Raghunandan, uh, Head of Department, Civil Department, to share the welcoming note with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to welcome everyone for uh, this seminar on GeoBIM, that is Geospatial Technologies in Digital Construction. So it's a very apt seminar which has been organized. I appreciate uh, Professor Jyoti Gupta and the School of Architecture in organizing this. I am sure you know everyone will benefit. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Anita Suchilan Head of Department of School of Architecture and all the rest of the faculty for this program. And I also like to invite and welcome Dr. E.R. Hegde, Executive Director of Pixel, and Mr. Sumit Tapa from Exegel, and Ms. Sakshi Singh. And of course, you know, all the dry slides. I'm sure. You know, this seminar will help you in look at the geospatial technology, which will benefit in the future for you. Now, why geospatial technologies in digital construction? If we look at, you know, traditionally when we start the construction, there are several errors we all experience. Because we used to always look at the local coordinates and there were several errors, you know, which we had to live with. Them. But with geospatial technologies or geospatial, you know, domain coming into picture, we can always now use the global coordinates and also try to see that, you know, we can come to the accurate value as much as possible. Uh, even BIM, for that matter, we have BIM now, which is being adopted by the civil engineering industry for quite some time. With use of BIM, we see that, you know, it is not limited to just 2D drawings or the 2D space alone. So we are using 3D spaces. So BIM is being used starting from the conceptualization stage of any project. So not just about buildings, it is used for infrastructure projects as well. So from conceptualized stage to during the construction and up to finishing, that is because you get as been drawing in the real time when you're using BIM. And with the use of BIM, you see that, you know, so much of conflicts have been reduced. And at the same time, when we say we reduce the conflicts, we also save so much of time and money. 
it is no longer that construction industry is a laggard in using the technologies. Because if civil engineering industry is not using the latest technologies, it will affect a lot. So though the margin of profit for the ROI compared to so many industries is not comparable when you compare with, let's say, construction, because the investment in technologies is quite high to begin with. But I'm sure with more and more people using it, so it will be quite affordable and it will benefit the users and all the stakeholders. So I once again appreciate the School of uh, Architecture in organizing this. I'm sure it, you know, all of us will benefit by this seminar. And we look forward to the presentation by all the resource people. I welcome everyone once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also call upon Dr. Anita Sushilan, Head of Department School of Architecture, to formally welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, Dr. Rajna Mitsu, all the faculty members, and dear Christ Child, all our students, and also the special speakers who are invited today for this wonderful event. I thank uh, Professor Jyoti Gupta for having organized this event because it's so timely. Uh, something which I am reminded of is that architectural practice is transforming a lot. I think this is the age of collaboration. And it is not that even within a team, it's much beyond teams. Actually, teams collaborating across, uh, you know, uh, physical, uh, social distance should never be a constraint in our practice. So I think, uh, uh, and also the scale of the projects of late have been kind of uh, remarkably different compared to the kind of projects which were earlier happening. So uh, in a way, I think architectural practice. Uh, when we are more uh, kind of limited by the uh, design phase of any architectural practice. But however, I think the platform has brought in this collaborative mode of various teams because it has been a very cumbersome act to kind of get in to end meeting. Uh, but right now we are at a phase where we can collaborate and also collaborate across teams. Uh, school of Architecture is a very young school at Christ University, incepted in the year 2017. Our first batch has just graduated. We have a master's program as well. Uh, uh, however, uh, I think uh, green, uh, green Vision has been very ambitious, and also our, uh, we, are, we have a very special cell treading more on the digital proficiency aspect of architectural learning, education, and even practice. Uh, some of our uh, visiting faculty inducted uh, also uh, Professor Arundam, uh, who's from RSV. Uh, he uh, has a long uh, number of years of experience from RSV. Uh, that's where I was uh, talking about the changing aspect of the professional uh, practice in architecture in the sense that uh, many times it's a myth that architectural practice is limited only to design and uh, practice uh, within confined to a firm. But off late, the practice also happens that there are firms which are lending services only in collaborative platforms. That is, the project comes from elsewhere and the project is transferred elsewhere, and you become a mediator for all of that. And I think this proficiency is quite important and needs to be sensitized right at the student phase, at, right at the education level as well. And I'm quite happy to kind of make a note here that uh, we recently had a value added program uh, initiated at School of Architecture. Uh, which is called the digital transformation in architecture and its practice, uh, which I in fact covered a lot of these and kind of collaborating many of these softwares which we are using at this platform. And it has been kind of quite tremendously kind of uh, uh, being uh, uh, applauded for this kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, so, uh, value courses uh, is something which allows the university to kind of tread upon emerging trends uh, in, the, in the industry, uh, which is not limited by the syllabus alone, because typically all this uh, academia is bounded by a uh, document of the syllabus, but value courses allows us 
more freedom within a year itself to kind of float programs, uh, which allows uh, emerging trends in the practice in the industry to be added. And also something very importantly I must note here is that this course allows vertically also to students to participate. It's not like it's confined only to certain higher semester level ever. Because of late, you know, we find that the proficiency that is required by the student and also their aspirations are quite high and it has to meet up with the proficiency that we need to render from the student. With that few words, I like to kind of conclude it uh, with uh, uh, a thank note to uh, Jyoti again for having organized this event and we really look forward to this workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. AGI or the Association of Geospatial Industries is a professional organization that represents the interests of geospatial industry in India and works towards advancing geospatial technology and their applications. AGI leads, connects, and builds an ecosystem of stakeholders relevant to the geospatial industry who develop, use, or benefit from these technologies. They play a, uh, they play a proactive role by extending outreach sharing knowledge, facilitating network and enabling business development for the geospatial industry in India, working with several layers of governance for improving policies related to geospatial technologies. I would like to call upon Ms. Sakshi Singh, the AJI coordinator on stage to speak a few words. We also have Ms. Neha and Mr. Satesh who would be joining us online and in the case who would also like to share a few thoughts with us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much. Uh, I am Sakshi Singh, and I'm here on behalf of uh, the Association of Geospatial Industries, um, AGI India. Uh, first of all, thank you. It's an immense pleasure for AGI to be here and to be sharing uh, what geospatial technologies are, how they can be used in the field of AEC and in the digital transformation of AEC. So, before we begin, before we have our expert speakers present to you, uh, I would like to give a brief overview of what AGI is and what we do and how they're relevant to the academic and research community in the country. Um, Uh, so, as already introduced, AGI is an industry association. Uh, so, you can call us um, a collective voice, a collective representation of the geospatial industry in the country. And our mission is really to voice uh, the industry, to bring business opportunities, to advocate applications of the technology, and to create an even conducive policy environment. And to do uh, through the following objectives of thought leadership, opportunity creation, industry support and development, policy advocacy, talent development, and enhancing geospatial adoption in the country. Um, 
Our members basically represent the entire spectrum of geospatial technologies from software and solution, cloud, you know, services. And uh, we have uh, a very good representation from not just the biggest enterprises, but also large, medium, and small scale businesses, as well as startups in the country who are working in the geospatial sector. Um, and one of the main mandates of AGI is to work very closely with the government uh, at the central, state, and local levels in working towards geospatial adoption, advocacy, and promotion. So uh, while there are many different sectors that geospatial technologies are applicable in, some of the major ministries, departments, and line agencies that we work with uh, come from geospatial model departments like the Survey of India, from agriculture, water, land resources, utilities, infrastructure, and urban development sectors, to name a few. Uh, this is a brief insight into the kind of initiatives that AGI has been working on for the last many years. One, of course, is policy advocacy. Another is development of standards for you know the technology, working with the technology and its um, application, its penetration in different sectors. We undertake a number of collaborations and engagements with not just governments, but also private companies and with the academic and research community like yours. Skilling and capacity building is one of our main focus areas in these times, along with knowledge and outreach. So AGI produces a lot of knowledge products, uh, reports, newsletters, case studies, so which are freely accessible to everyone online on our website. Uh, this is you know, to promote the uses of geospatial technologies and to make people more aware about how these technologies transcend into different sectors. Uh, as I said, engagement with the academia has been one of our main focus areas. So we recently signed two MOUs with the SET University Ahmedabad and SKNU Delhi. And uh, so basically, we are helping universities vet their course curriculum to you know make uh, the curriculum more tech inclusive as well as uh, tech agnostic. And uh, besides that, workshops, seminars, knowledge products, collaboration over research projects. These are some of the areas that we are engaging in. Uh, AGI, as I mentioned, has a dedicated knowledge center on the website. Uh, one of which, you know, one of the knowledge products that we came up with in the last couple of years, I would like to highlight, that is the report on role of geospatial technologies in urban affairs in India, which will be very relevant to you. So uh, this is a very comprehensive report. It talks about firstly the status of urbanization in India and what the outlook is like. What are the challenges? So this report was mainly created for um, different urban governance professionals, not just from the central level, but also states and uh, local level uh, municipalities, corporations, and other development authorities. So we tried to map out what are the different challenges in different sectors of uh, urban development. So city planning, property taxation, land resources. So what are these sectors? What are the challenges in these sectors? We try to map out. And also, uh, what role geospatial technology and the facilitator technologies like IoT, cloud computing, big data, AI, ML, how these can be combined to come up with solutions, uh, use cases. We have in this report, we have highlighted some very interesting case studies and um, some basically some free tools that are available that uh, these governments professionals can use. So this is a very good report if you want to understand what these technologies are and how they can be uh, applicable in different sectors of urban development. We also come up with bi-monthly newsletters on different themes. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is on BIM and GIS that we came up with a few months ago. And uh, our newsletters are also, again, very comprehensive. We have interviews from the industry. So we had an interview from our member company, Trindle, um, as well as we have inter uh, interviews from the user sector. So we had an interview from uh, the Bangalore International Airport Terminal, how they used geospatial technology for the new terminal. Uh, the entire process, the full uh, project life cycle, they've used this technology. Then the newsletter also contains case studies and articles from companies themselves. So it gives you a very good idea of um, uh, how these technologies are being used on the ground. So this is the link to this knowledge center. You can easily scan it. You can download the knowledge products. You can read articles, blogs to you know, enhance your knowledge. And uh, that is it from my side. Now I would uh, hand it over to the expert speakers who would present more on 
uh, you know, the applications of these technology in the sector. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. We are now headed to welcome our esteemed guest speakers for the day, Dr. Vial Hegde and Mr. Sunit Thapa. We will have the talk followed by the question answer session, so I request the audience to keep their questions down. Our first speaker for the day, Dr. Vigneshwar R. Hegde, is the Executive Director of Pixel Software and the Domain Technology Application Expert with management consulting experience of more than 25 years. He is an earth system science uh, scientist specialist and proficient in water resources development and management, remote sensing and GIS applications, e-governance and development planning. Dr. Hegde has delivered several, several lectures in India and abroad on smart cities, urban management, earth sciences, uh, earth sciences irrigation management, and agricultural go, among other themes. So I would humbly like to invite Sir on stage for his talk. Oh, good afternoon to everyone. Yeah. <laughs>
Sorry for a small uh, peek in the beginning. Good afternoon to everybody. I am very much pleased as soon as I entered the campus. I only remember the, the wonderful days which I had spent in my campus when I was doing my post graduation and doctorate. Anyway, this wonderful campus which has been visited by me, not as a campus, as a uh, rural landscape since 1990. So I am very much pleased to see this campus coming up here in front of my you know, movement around the micro road. Anyway, today's uh, discussion or what we said, rather I would put it as not as a lecture or not as a simple presentation of some case studies. And let me have it as a kind of interactive where I sh share my thoughts and my experience, some of the case studies. Many of them may not be possible to be shown because of the contract because I'm in a commercial business. Anyway, uh, probably all of you should understand what it is. This way it starts. Could you recognize this picture? That's where I start with geospatial technologies for digital construction is wonderful. I appreciate. I start beginning of this image. That's where you start beginning of your the conceptualization of geospatial technology, science, and then these things like that. Is there anyone who understands this picture? What it is? It's an image. Great. You have been able to identify your campus on Google. Thanks to Google. Prior to 9, 2000, there was no Google, no free data available to visualize also. We were going ahead with uh, paper print. Of course, GIS was there, but printing was more adopted or more thought of. And when I come to the other things, Digital construction, geospatial technology. I may not aptly define the terminology digital construction, but rather it uh, it's basically having a digital record of what you plan, what you draft, and then what you redraft and then keep it as a repository. It could be in the Online is not available. Okay. Is it available? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'll not repeat my words. Digital construction. Of course, there is no separate construction technology as such. Digital construction is only added value to your plan, design, retrieve, and then revisit this thing so that the paper based what used to be the earlier days, almost three, four decades back, of course, the paper data drafts and then drawings is now replaced with your CAD drawings or the vector drawings organized in a software package so that you can visualize it, manipulate it, add, and analyze multi-layer kind of a thing. And it translates further to where I come to a point is an asset. In the campus, each building is an asset. 
That means whole two part. As an entire campus, you have got roads, you have got buildings, parks, water parks, so many things associated together. Then, as a big asset, asset in asset. So value, what we say, life cycle of an asset. You can take it from a campus to a big, you know, the auditorium or a big complex to individual residential building also. That's how it stands to. The life cycle of an asset starts with such planning, then goes for designing, engineering, then construction, and then later operation maintenance. After some time, you renovate it, and then what we say, demolish or reconstruct it, whatever it is. In every state, we have geospatial technology coming into picture. What is that geospatial technology, which I talk to a little later? Essentially, it is geographic information system with different uh, tools. So, GIS, what we call geospatial or geographic information system, comes from the top, whole to part. It's, it starts from the periphery, then goes to individual. Whole to part, what we call as a planner, many of you maybe may have, or maybe in the course of urban planning or regional planning or country planning or you know campus planning kind of a thing as an architect. Yes. On the other side, civil engineers from the infrastructure you know, side. And then coming to that entire design part of it, computer added design software CAD drawings. And then as Professor has just told, we used to use sir, our normal drawings for FEM analysis earlier. I did it in 80s. But now everything is stat, simple stat. You go and then put your CAD data and then go for any kind of modeling analysis. So that way, FEM also comes into picture. And then essentially is digital model of buildings used for construction planning. This is how in an actual we can approach the subject. But subject itself within the limitation of our couple of hours discussion may be very difficult to define and then explore completely. Let me try to put in, in and piece together some of the important things. What is life cycle of an asset? Where did it start? Planning, design engineering, as I told, construction, operation and maintenance, renovation and reuse, and then being digital this is exactly what I was talking about is uh, the advantages is uh, just now uh, Professor has told increased collaboration. That's where the importance of digital technology, particularly GIS or what is geospatial comes in, greater transparency, and then improved project tracking. What we need is today monitoring. What we say is well planned is well begun or something like that, well incubated. That well mon monitored is one which extends the span of life of whatever is done, design whatever you have done. And then as built information, which cuts in, in between, is very much essential. You would have planned, you would have designed, while construction there would have been some modification, redesign, or because of the constraints of time and then change in the perspectives, you must have revisited and then constructed them. It is as built drawing. It could be GIS save files or GIS database, spatial database, as well as CAD database. And then renovation. It's very important because normally any building 75, 80 years or whatever you plan, or any infrastructure project would have put a um, age for it or a time span for it. Before it passes over to the, the limited time, whatever it is, you need to use it. That's how as built diagrams or uh, diagrams are very much important. That's what I'm talking about the content. So, uh, stop me if I'm going too much historical or philosophical. Where it starts, can it start? Any human being, any creature on the earth surface has a basic instinct of geographic context. Even a bird or ant and any animal builds its nest or the small dwelling unit based upon the periphery or environment and its congenial part of it. And it defines a territory and it, it internally defines a territorial picture. And any disturbance 
we try to rebuild and then relocate this cell. So that's how the context of geospatial technology, GIS, what we call it that. Okay. And then evolution has witnessed. You must have seen Mandalore Arapa or different civilizations have settled on a place where uh, the requirements are very critical. In it. So you can understand as a graduates of civil engineering or architect, when you start on your desk to plan, you gather the information about surroundings and then so many things which are peripherals, which may be adequate enough to the point. Then modern society has uh, gone extended for studying feasibility, planning, development towards filling the gaps of resources part of it. Today, I can give a small uh, quote. Bangalore is situated, you are all part of the Bangalore region. Bangalore never had water supply from Kaveri in the years of 19, earlier to 1975. It was Tipu Bernardi, and then Jetagatta Lake was supplying water. Then you kept on growing. Today we are 30 million. Then water was not adequate. Kaveri was planned. So my and your footprints are in Kaveri, which is beyond Bangalore's Bangalore district. Our water footprint, that means it was engineering marvel. 400 liters we pump up the water and then 135 kilometer length. Just imagine engineering marvel till today, not a single incidence of water hammer, sir, in the Kaveri pipeline. Anybody in the civil engineering infrastructure, you must have definitely remembered her. I have not heard so far water hammer problem in the Bangalore water supply line. It's already it is almost four decades ago. So that's what I tell you that the modern society or we have started developing and Bridging the gap. In the process, what happens? Ultimately, thematic analysis becomes very much important. Okay, and then ultimately, the construction technology also has to be. Not only the design engineering part of it, construction management, construction technology has to improve. It has to be added by current technology so that you optimize your time. Time is cost overrun automatically. This is how when any engineering project or architecture, unless until it speaks very critically on the cost part of it, it is nowhere near to the human beings or societal issues. It has to be part and parcel of the, the costing of the planning and the design part of it. Unless until you have cost efficiency coming into picture, that means here from start to finish, how do you plan? How do you revisit? How do you collaborate? Improvise it and then present it to the investor or the management which is going to construct whatever it is. Unless until you have the versioning part of it, which is possible to be presented on digital mode, it doesn't have anything else. And then is basically communication have been improved using this digital technology. And then uh, so as you know, the industry, particularly the construction industry and the real estate. So now the philosophy is data. Data manipulation, data augmentation, data organization and presentation analysis. Okay, the background nerve of the whole uh, theme for digital uh, or geospatial is the data. Data is the key and spatial data. And then for consumers, the real estate and the construction. It could be infrastructure or buildings or bridges or whatever you call the construction and the real estate are the consumers of the geospatial industry, you know, the technology. And uh, that's how you, of course, we are already there. We have been very beginners in the 80s. Now we have moved to certain level as um, postgraduate students or graduates or architects in the civil engineering try to adopt, inculcate GIS as your uh, favorite subject from that. Of course, I'm now slowly coming to what is GIS, how does it play a role in the civil engineering as well as in the architectural part. Building the relationship with the surroundings. 
I took an example of any creature's basic instinct. Similarly, a location, for example, your campus list. Before 2000, I have not seen the campus list. Because I had done the west nearby the township here, industrial area, which was called township earlier. Now it has become industrial area. I was planning for this. I have done the complete uh, suitability analysis and feasibility analysis. That time this was not there. So you have got a campus. That means probably, I don't know whether anyone of you have been involved in the process of establishing the campus here. Location wise, campus overall campus wise, architecture wise, and then things like that. But definitely, whosoever have done this campus design or planning must have definitely taken care of. And one more thing, which you may have a question in mind, the land. Land should be available, then only I can plan. So land pressure on land also matters. So you need to think about in 360 degree about locating. That was building a spatial relationship with any location or a region or a space is what we call. And then or there we call environment, it speaks about land, infrastructure, water, vegetation, and your structure. One most one more the important thing is the terrain suitability structural aspect of it. Civil engineers you do the stability analysis and so many things for constructing a pillar or something like that. Okay, what's called geotechnical. As a geologist, I call it a different thing. I call it geostructural. Okay, because we get into a little lower mantle and then upper mantle and lower crust. That's a different thing. And then aesthetic part of it, which is most important. Then I I put this for you. You fill up the diagram, which establishes the relationship. This kind of a diagram or the graph. Many of you may be familiar, or the entire globe is familiar. So you see the central part, the construction as an asset, which is influenced by different different parameters. Unless until you relate it, analyze it in the proper perspective, you will not be able to plan in a perspective manner. You will not be able to define the lifespan of a project. You will not be able to define higher up what we call. So you can define, there may be some gaps, you may add on certain things. I leave it to your skin. Okay. Geospatial technology, there are two kinds. One is data capturing or data acquisition. I have been, uh, of course, having good experience in uh, remote sensing application. The satellite images is one of the, the best today. Of course, it has been in the use only after 1980s in our country. And we have been one of the fortunate enough to have started the first satellite images to be used for uh, applications. And then uh, global posing system, of course, today everyone carries the mobile. That is that UAV and then data. Unmanned aerial vehicle to the drone. It is now becoming a common activity within the uh, where, you know, marriage hall, as well as in a symposia, everywhere it has become a common gadget, but its importance for our uh, team is very much important. And the other one is, which everybody knows it, PTR, ground penetrating radar, and then uh, geophysical spontaneous potential, electrical resistivity, or magnetic, seismic, or gravity. These are different geographical, what we say geophysical, you know, the technologies which produces data for us, patient attribute. And then data compilation, organization, visualization analysis, where you see when a GIS tool, probably you must have heard about uh, proprietary tools today, RGIS, Bentley providers, uh, MapInfo, these are all the proprietary, you know, on the you know, commercially available. And I have uh, one Interesting thing, I started with my GIS in 86 or 87 with graphs, open source. Okay, and today a lot of uh, softwares are available as open source. Coming to last about 10 years, we didn't have much open source and uh, open software coming into platform, and we had a lot of problems of commercial aspects of software. 
this was also one of the constraints in the academia to have this software and then teach the students and then do this for different applications. CAD, the photogrammetry, of course, today's cost has come down. And uh, there are a couple of open source photogrammetry, but they are not that uh, powerful. Certain photogrammetric, uh, photogrammetric tools are very good because it uses LIDAR data, mobile or drone data, satellite data, or aerial photograph used for precision measurement because slowly we are moving to data capture into quantitative aspects, which is engineering. Okay, and CAD BIM, of course, these are the software you might be uh, directly using it currently, and internet mapping services. Probably today's generation must have seen web WFM, and W, you know, web map series, web feature services kind of thing for internet applications. Probably. So, slowly, I just uh, worry for I will not be able to share the correct case study, which is relevant. We have delivered results. I will be taking examples of that and then going ahead. Only to impress upon you that this is possible. I was talking about planning, building spatial relationship with that. This is Bangalore Metropolitan Region. Uh, probably it's not visible to you. Just around the brown uh, image there, down that's a star. Okay, that is Nash University. I located it. A couple of days back when I got the coordinates of Kaish University. Next is this. This is geostructural landscape. I don't know how many of you are aware. Adjacent to your campus on the eastern side, you have a river called Vishimavati. Any one of you seen? Seen it in flood? Flood Street River? No, just I'm asking you. Yes, yes. Good. That means you know where this flood is coming to you, coming to your campus nearby. One is from the western side, the national highway and the train track, everything. It's a small watershed here. And then flood comes or the runoff generates locally, should get past to the university. Okay. This is what we are only talking about how we get this patient data, correlate with ourselves, regional or local. Within the local and the support of it. And next, I'll take one more example of painting. Bangalore Urban District. Okay, before that, I'll show only that. Where you have the central, because now none of our this area is not in the part of uh, Bangalore, no. but Bangalore Mahanagar Corporation, Corporation area. It's a rural area. Central part till 19, uh, 2007, it was 2006, it was Bangalore Nagar Palike, Mahanagar Palike of 220 square kilometer. Then it was going in all directions. Municipal authorities felt it is unbearable. Government thought I would increase the dimension of Bangalore Mahanagar Palike. At the same time, there were satellites around, satellites in terms of Kengiri, and then Adivasi Nagar. Hosting our Yelhanka, uh, all these things have to be amalgamated so that the uh, unscrupulous, whatever you call planned or unplanned development in the periphery of Bangalore, Mahanagar Parki area are brought into regulation. So in 2007, finally, DMP area, Bangalore Mahanagar Palki area of 211 or 20 square kilometers and become 710 square kilometers by amalgamating Kengeri, Chalamanka, Yarpura, Krishnarajni, Mahadevpura, all these local bodies. And then instead of having it wedges, you know, unscrupulous development, villages were also merged. The indices. Incidentally, I tell you, I was behind this. Village wise index for urbanization. We developed an index for urbanization of individual village. Basically, demographic, socioeconomic data, and the current pattern of development, landscape, revenue, everything. So, individual village have been given an index for urbanization. That these are the 110 villages. You, mean, you see now, small Mahanagar policy becoming Brahat Mahanagar policy. And where are the entities have come in? How they are related for the administrative kind of it, and then challenge for 
urban planning master planning for bangalore metropolitan region and bda and then bdnt now today so 2015 onwards master plan for bangalore has been going on even now also you may not have the one which is ultimate final one it is still draft only and finally when we go to that of course it is smaller one we have developed the uh, spatial database of rural areas for bangalore because uh, it goes back as early as 1994 as structural plan for Bangalore metropolitan region. Okay, from that day, having kept the single coordinate system, Bangalore data has grown. So here I want to speak one word about single coaxial telescopic as GIS. You should understand this so that. You change the gear of a motorbike or a car, first two, second, third, four. Still, energy is added up, but act is one and the same. That's a scale composition, just like a telescopic, zoom in, zoom out, and then you have the scale part of it. That's how we have built. Now, to read this Bangalore data, and then you are telling about everywhere the spots are available, locations are available. I have the data, but only not for you, for my client. Anyway, that's a different issue, maybe. Couple of years down the line, it might come to public. Google is giving. Google is similar, giving you free access to data and put your point, put your in class point, put your mother's point everywhere, and then doing the common, you know, AI there. It's a human, uh, you know, habit, you know. The moment you get into Google, first thing is you look at your house and lock it. By habit, it goes to your in class house or mother's house or friend's house. You do that part, and your frequent places, hotels or something like you pick it up. After 10 days, 15 days, some friends come, you do that again. Definitely look, I have located my place, you should. That other gentleman sitting behind the engine takes care of an entire thing, your revisiting habits. That's how the data, you say, no, Google is the ultimate. Never trust it. But take it for with the reference. That's how the AI works in the behind. Locate the intelligence is contributed by we that for crowd. Okay. And GIS, of course, it is a small. Uh, if anybody from Bangalore the city is staying there, it's near Narbak, 3D models. Okay. 3D models are important in terms of one is perspective, aesthetics. Best to pick in the region locality. A small quote I can give if anybody has seen uh, Lalbad near the south gate, main gate, Lalbad main gate, probably what is that MTR hub? Probably anybody is not there in Bangalore who has not visited the MTR. Okay, just behind the MTR. Have you seen in recent years, the 23rd, 20th, no, almost 22, 23 floor, big apartment has come up. If you see in Google or if you see pass by, don't you see it's a mistake? As an architect, as a planner, you have to look at the region and the trust on the traffic, trust on the water side, trust on the waste part before you advocate or design for different kind of structure. This is feasible only when you have data. If the data is not put in a register, data has to be integrated into the GIS part. That's how it comes into it. And then one thing I'll just take a vote here. Bangalore, this is uh, 1995. I'm sorry, I'm uh, not able to enlarge it now because of the you know constraint of PowerPoint. If I had a chance to pull up my desktop, I would enlarge it to go to 20,000 scale and then show it to you. This is 1995 data of BPNT. That means Bangalore, our Bangalore city, greater Bangalore city. Now it is extended to beyond up to Delhi. This is 2022. I had an opportunity of uh, participating in the third containment during the last other September. This is September with the data of Bangalore. People may ask me, that was cloudy. Fortunate enough, about 20 minutes of time, the satellite was passing Sentinel. Probably clouds were nearby, Margaret and other side. 
they were not passing through the river and that particular time of five, ten minutes, when it was split, if I show the entire season, now scene of this uh, city, western portion is slowly, eastern portion is slowly, because there was some window of 10 to 15 minutes available where road was on there. That's how September 5th, I tell you, you must have heard about, you know, so you were the campus adjacent to that, there was a flood, no? Because of national highway. Vehicles were drowned. Vehicles are parked for weeks together. I am sure of this because we documented the certain thing. Why floods were there here? Of course, not just above the campus yet. Here, by in the region, you must have heard about it. And then, next thing is very interesting. You know, you should carefully read the sentences here. I have just shown what was in 2001, what was in 2010. What is that in 2020? That means the cement concrete, concrete general in BBMP, how it has expanded. The open landscape has become constructive aid. Okay, this we had used to justify social economic growth of Bangalore in the absence of census data for 2021. Very recently concluded study, which I was a consultant for the delimitation of walls in Bangalore for uh, government, urban government. I used heavy with GIS and it was also on the uh, no, internet global for 60 days for public opinion. I'm just calling it as assessing the opportunity for whatever you call it. Now I leave it to you. It should occur to you. 2001-2011. How the population has migrated. See, now obviously, Christ University, which was part of the heart of the center of Bangalore city, near Kormangala and then the Dairy Circle. In fact, I was confused. I want to go there. Suddenly, the location I got here, that is Mysore University, Mysore Road campus, I draw down here. Okay? Definitely. Why you have looked at this much of land was not available within three kilometers radius of Bangalore city? You must need bigger land. Connected supply systems, everything that's how you come out. So, this is an opportunity. Architects, when you go into simple, there are two three aspects. I will, I'm sorry to talk about only one minute. Urban regional planning is also part of architecture, I feel. You teach that, no? Urban planning. Urban planning in this region encompasses of regional planning, level development. You have grid pattern or circular pattern or different, different patterns of you know, different architects. To have developed our important towns and then cities in India. Right. Yeah, this is one design. Invariably today, design is done in cash because uh, you know, measuring and then getting into that. GIS has still to go to this level of drawing. Drafting skill in a GIS is little limited, but CAD is wonderful. So, drafting. Normally goes, design goes in CAD. In architect use different as you care of different different software. Civil engineers use CAD and the CAD map or so many things are there. And then the next part is it's for the urban WhatsApp like also. As a concluded as a part of smart city project in our state itself. So the other thing is design entire as built data of urban WhatsApp. Is. So, urban water supply project has built drawing of DMAs, walls, different pipe dias, consumer locations are important. So, here I've just shown those things. Next is part tracing. What is doing like that? Everybody needs water, everybody needs connected. If he has a problem with the water supply, couple of days, he has to go and then complain. It's a geospatial technology comes to the picture. Imagine, of course, we have given this a symbolical model, and then it is now coming up as a project. Or provide the community or the citizen with an app from the water supply authority. That means if he has a constraint, let him simply put a complaint and then post it. Just you do in the WhatsApp, you know, or whatever you do using mobile. It comes back and then sits in the server. 
because of the coordinate system, it gets located. Once it is getting located, you have built up the complete network of pipes or uh, the walls and everything. Where is the constraint located? Then if the constraint is located into district, you know, what is the pipe diameter, where it is connected, how many people are connected? This once if he knows the what supply manager knows, he can immediately take a picture and take a drawing and assist or deploy his service engineer to that particular locality. Suddenly, he does not have it, he'll go and then block other walls. Then, instead of 100 people, 1000 people will get blocked over for example. If he does not know correctly where the location of all is, okay. Then, one more. Of course, uh, probably my industry colleague, that person will be talking about the more of a construction site part of it. This is one of the drone in the, you know, where I have been using it. Excavation monitoring. Today, you know, you have heard yesterday, highway construction projects in Karnataka have been slightly under slow pace because of the non supply of construction material. Last 25 days, all the crushers and queries have stopped. Probably, I don't know whether you are aware of that. And then in Karnataka state, normally the quarries are being monitored for their excavation because YIT is there for count. One of the applications is drone where we can assess the volumetric extraction of granite or whichever stone it is for aggregates or up to 10 mm size, not 10, 10 centimeter size, to down 4 centimeter size crushes, building blocks. In all dimension blocks. I had done a case study. This is a part of one of the queries in uh, KR patent. Okay. One of other things, sorry, these are all certain things because variety issues may come. And next, I will, before concluding, this is campus. You are in the campus. You have got a couple of resources with you. Embark upon building a GIS of your class, campus. If I'm not done anything. Okay. Locate everything, including roads, pavements, parks, undulations, landscaping elements, trees, most important trees, and then pipelines, sewage, water supply, recycled water supply, uh, water lines, and then any other electric or telephone or cable, everything. This IIT Chennai campus. Uh, the current one, I'm not able to produce it because it's a, when we gave it about eight years back, there was a beginning and then they have taken over. We have guided them, built the application, gave it to them, then it is on their own. We never wanted to continue as, you know, credit with them for all. Develop that, deploy it, engage with them a couple of years, then downward ramp. We came out. The earlier one, I'm showing it here. So, probably, you see, it is uh, electrical network. You can do this. Idea is only that. Similar to the teacher's poles. And this is the uh, uh, parking. Okay, parking areas. For what kind of parking? You would have a designated parking place here. You have made it. You are earlier designers and clients must have made it. Bring it back to the drafting, the digital mode here. Okay, that's one of the best things what you can do. And then it is uh, parking located by the number of vehicles, number of motorbikes or cycles, whatever you put it. When it is overloaded, then you see the frequency. You have people around, service people, they can always locate it and put the uh, input to online, you can make it or offline, you can make it or the service industry people, they are here. Security, they can get the data and feed it. Then you know it is the occupancy usage. It appears to be auditorium as every building spaces, classrooms in this building, big building. The has gets seem to be occupancy level and two. It is not only a structural part of it, it is over. Once you have designed, you plan, you are constructed, it's over. Coming with the occupancy, that means as we go, you know, diagram or in data, locate it. This is such a wonderful hall of not less than 200 people here, probably capacity 200. If it is not occupied, investment also this. I tell you, charity should begin at home. 
we should value this important investment onto this conference hall at small classroom of 40 people or 40 students. Little uh, display mode, whatever it is. If it is not used even once in a week, don't you think that investment is gone? Probably everything is looked in this angle and then build the analysis. You would reach wonderful advantage of geospatial technology for you know construction of management of that kind. This is a very similar one in campus. Okay. Now I'll come to small exercise given to you. As you have told, I, I have uh, initiated my discussion of what we say. Region two, the whole two parts. Bangalore region and then the relationship. So here I put Christ University down the line. How it is related, or you can imagine the movement from uh, Bangalore city to that, and then where is the urban limit? That means so called urban limits of corporation, then industry area, how they are related. You can see that. Next is the location. Little slightly enlarged. Now it is your campus as on 2022. Okay, date is not known. Probably, maybe in a couple of months, I have a chance to get there. And then, uh, cut, cut off that data of 7.36 meters. I'm getting it for a small date anyway. That this is 2022. Now I'll it is 2009. The water pond, what you say, beautiful landscape elements were the planners or the builders of this campus have made. Okay. Now you see them small, small white patches there. But if you go, I was talking to Madam, they were queries, rock queries. Series of queries, one was abandoned, one was abandoned. And so part of the landscape here. Incidentally, when you got it, it was made. Now you see the campus. There are three con continuously that thing. You must have entered the water landscape here. That's how it goes. I think uh, with that, I conclude that means it's adding making environmental safer, efficient, and then the delivery operation and renewal part of it ensures better outcome of every stages of the life cycle of an asset. In the nutshell, I have told the data is the key, data organization is the key. Technology part, you have got the geospatial acquisition, data acquisition, data modernizing the technology. And then when you go into construction monitoring, my other speaker would speak about it because drone is heavily used, radar is being heavily used. And then, as I was telling 10 years back, my friend architect, while connecting my own home, he used to get a photo from mobile and then uh, pass on to his phone. And he used to say, No, 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 there's some. We need to do it. We need to send an advice to you. It has been practiced here and there. But now that is not that. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, let us spend some time. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We move on to our second speaker of the day, Mr. Sumit Thapa. Mr. Sumit Thapa is a technical manager at Hexagon with over 17 years of work experience in the geospatial industry. He has been associated with Hexagon for over a decade now, working closely with almost every national mapping agency in the country, various government R&D organizations, and numerous educational institutes. Mr. Thapa has been a part of several distinguished projects like Bharat Maps, BBML, Swamitra, and Smart Cities Mission, to name a few. Mr. Sumit will be joining us online. 
Thank you very much. So good afternoon to all the same guests and good afternoon to Dr. Hegde for setting up the stage. And it will be a little easier for me now. So I'll just share my share screen. Share. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I've just shared my screen. I hope uh, it is visible to you. Not yet. So I'll share again. I have shared it now. Is it visible to you all? Yes, sir. We are yes, just sir, checking. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, so today's theme of the webinar is uh, GeoBIM and building better with the technologies and our focus will be on geospatial technology how it is going to help you in construction uh, these are the topics uh, i have actually planned to cover geospatial and uh, why geospatial your cad and bim and how we are going to integrate geospatial and bim and the concept called geobim will be implemented and used for various applications why then we talk about reality capture reality capture is one of the thing actually which will help you out a lot in construction monitoring as well as for uh, many heritage sites it is used it is actually widely being used and we'll just see its applications so why geospatial uh, this part is already covered by the previous speaker dr Hegre. so i'll just <coughs> don't reiterate i'll just say geospatial is basically going to give you the map data as well as the information which generally a normal or your map graphics cannot give. So it can actually, through the use of database information system, it can give you many other aspects that is associated with those graphics. So you can always uh, display, capture, store, and analyze these data sets. And when we talk about geospatial, there are different types of geospatial data sets that is available, which we are going to use for uh, planning purposes. One is aerial and UAV, which you have just seen now. So this is very widely used in geospatial industry. Then we have point cloud data sets. So this is <clears throat> where the LIDAR data comes into picture and this is used widely now. We'll see how it helps in reality capture as well. We have vector data sets. We have thermal, which will be used for your uh, temperature or how the heat polygons are actually now playing a role uh, in your urban areas. Radar data sets uh, is basically comes from SAR, satellite, hyperspectral and elevation data, which will actually give you the <clears throat> information about the topographic of any area. And using these different data sets, you can do analysis. So these geospatial analysis, uh, some of them are you can visualize it in 3D visualization. You can measure it. You can capture the information as it is available on the ground. You can analyze, you can do the analysis like hotspot and all. <clears throat> you can classify these images and create your land use, land cover map, how the different uh, aspects are available in the ground of that area. You can use it for panoramic uh, images. So reality capture is how why, uh, where panorama will give you information, which is <clears throat> available on ground, just sitting on your lab or on your computer. And definitely mapping is one of the aspect <clears throat> where geospatial data plays a very big role. So with today's advancement in computers, with the help of your CPU and GPU, now even geospatial data has become, you know, very uh, dense and very detailed in nature. So if you see here, using the geospatial data and different uh, 
capturing techniques you can actually create the building models like this in 3d <clears throat> and which is actually traditionally a domain of BIM model so this geospatial data can give you the area of the building what is the height of the building surface area but still what is inside that building how many stairs are there how many floors are there so these all information is traditionally been kept in BIM so that's why we need to incorporate geospatial and BIM and we need to come to GeoBIM. So how geospatial is going to help you out? I'll just turn a small video and just it will <coughs> show you. So with geospatial first is you'll get the information about any location that is available. <coughs> you have satellite images that will show you how the city is actually placed in that here in that scenarios you have 3d models which will give you the <coughs> skyline of that particular area and how the topography of that <coughs> area is placed you can integrate many other different informations here in this case like you have lidar data which will give you the <coughs> height information about each and every building to a very precise level and once you have these data sets you can also you know dig in further and you can go to the street level so which is now one of the hot topics because <clears throat> almost all the 100 smart cities are going to be reality captured like this and you can have a panorama view. So <clears throat> these views are not just a you know photographic view. You can also do analysis here like measurements, your angles, your heights, your <clears throat> width. So all these things can be measured here on this reality captured data as well. <clears throat> and what GIS can give you, it can integrate other information also. If you have some other sensors like noise sensor, thermal sensors or traffic congestion, so you can get a head spot. So where you have more noise, where you have more traffic congestions, and it will help you in planning out your information more efficiently and better in a better way. So that's what exactly geospatial will help you out. So in this scenario, you can actually navigating through some of the streets, you see how the land profile are available <clears throat> along that street and how different different building elevation is present in that corridor. So these kind of analysis can be done using geospatial data sets. Now geospatial data has become very rich and it will give you lots and lots of detailed information. So that's how geospatial is going to help you in different different aspects. <clears throat> so next is uh, we'll come to how CAD and BIM is going to basically integrate with your geospatial data set. So traditionally CAD is uh, your product design. Any product has been designed in your uh, design files. So these design files can be used for as a preliminary designs and it can be used for in 2D. It can be used in 3D drawings. Now you have wireframe and solid models also for that drawing which can be displayed. <clears throat> so CAD helps you in designing any product, any building, any uh, town for say, if you say. So these informations are designed in CAD, but <clears throat> these information then can be extended and created as a BIM model, so which will give you further information. So why you need to move from CAD to BIM, basically it will <clears throat> give you more information, it will give you detailed information about each and every building. So same design files can be used for 3d modeling it can be used for you know beam information and detailing as well in case you want a 3d model or 3d city designed in <clears throat> the cad information from the cad information only so that's why we need to move from cad to bim and bim uh, it's basically a virtual and digital representation of your design and how you have actually planned that uh, buildings to be that structure to be and as you increase the level of details in that building, so LOD, the level of detail of that BIM will also keep on increasing and that will be displayed <coughs> in your model also. So we'll just see some of the <coughs> structures here, how BIM will help you out. So BIM will not just help you out in actually designing, it will also help you out in uh, construction monitoring and progress monitoring of any project. So in this particular <coughs> case, if you see here, each and every structure how it has been planned uh, it has been monitored how it is progressing over the pe different period of time you can visualize it in a uh, different time stamp manner so bim doesn't only use for design it is also used for operations and management as <clears throat> it has been reiterated uh, i'm just reiterating what dr Hed Hegde has already mentioned earlier in his slides or presentations 
So BIM is a very useful model for <clears throat> progress monitoring operations management. Then why we say why we want to actually you know amalgamate GIM, uh, BIM and geospatial. Geospatial will give you the idea about the environment, how the particular environment of that particular area is. So whenever you are planning <clears throat> some structures, so how <clears throat> that structure is going to be look like in with the current skyline so that you can visualize when you incorporate your BIM and your special data. So right now you are not seeing any, uh, you're seeing a BIM model which has been designed with the current structures that is present on ground. If you plan any building of such kind, how it is going to look like, like with the current skyline, how you have the visualization and the view from different, different uh, rooftops or different, different levels of the building so all these things you can see because your spatial will give you the <clears throat> idea about the environment that is present and <clears throat> in that uh, area and how your structure is going to look like in that particular area this is one of the use cases so we'll just move to second you can also use it for seeing the how you, you have planned for any uh, say plant site is planned how well it has been actually incorporated with the current uh, landscape of that area how the approach road is coming <clears throat> how that particular plant that has been designed is looking with respect to the other uh, landscape that is present there any uh, high tension wire any tunnel, anything is uh, that is uh, going out there, if it is there, it can be hazardous or not. So these things can be seen and planned. And obviously, if some corrective measures need to be taken, it can be taken using geospatial and BIM integration. So <clears throat> and another example is operations and management as, as uh, we were talking about. So BIM model can, if you uh, incorporate in GIS, you can have the actual data of that particular plant in this case here the actual laser scan of this particular plant is available so you can see how you have planned for this particular uh, plant and how the, each and every component is actually looking in that particular plant and this is the uh, not the <coughs> planned uh, or sorry this is not the actually uh, model this is what is present on that particular structure and it has been scanned using the laser scanner terrestrial laser scanners this is another use case of geospatial and BIM. In this case, we have uh, used the reality capture. So here, if you see <coughs> how geospatial and reality capture is going to help you out. So this is one of the structure which has been uh, scanned and you also have the reality capture data. So once we go in inside the panorama, you can visualize this the actual structure on ground how it looks like and the other information has also been integrated in this structure so even though you are inside a panorama you are visualizing it in 3d but you can see each and every component its attribute information which may come from being more gis so what kind of structure is there what is the pressure it can take what is the capacity so all this information is coming from the database and <clears throat> using our geospatial data of laser scans and reality capture and the BIM data, these information is actually available inside the geospatial environment. So geospatial usually doesn't give uh, all these information which is available. These available informations are available through the BIM models. So each and every components, its type, its uh, structure, its capacity. So for progress monitoring purpose, for visualizing how your actual construction is going on. So this will give you is what has been planned versus what is actually available on ground as of now. So as planned versus as built, uh, you can do analysis. So this is some of the examples. Now I'll just come to another example. <coughs> so 
so this is for uh, basically visualizing it and how seeing how the structure was looking like and now here if you see here the bim model has been again incorporated with the existing structures you can use it for your different shadow analysis with respect to the building that is available already available on ground you can see it <clears throat> by at different different levels how these systems were planned even your electrical wiring hvac systems your uh, exit systems everything elevators so what has whatever has been planned you can visualize it on a geospatial environment using geospatial and bim and you can see how it is actually matching with the current skyline of that particular area so you can so it depends upon the level of details of that bim how it is going to look like so if you have a very enriched bim you are going to have each and every details of that particular building up to the staircases and uh, the structures you can see here this cabinets and closet that is available in that building so everything is available so so these information can only come from bim so geospatial usually doesn't have these information geospatial only have information up to where that building is what is the area what is the surface area it is covering and what is the height and the 3d model but if you want to go inside and see each and every <clears throat> information and aspects of a bim uh, of a building then we need to actually incorporate geospatial with bim and bim can give all these very detailed information which is not a domain of a geospatial <clears throat> another use case is for uh, redevelopment purposes so if you you are planning for a structure that has been <coughs> uh, sorry if you're planning for some <laughs> objects uh, where you already have a structure a very old structure and you want to demolish and redevelop it how it is going to look and how it is going to fit in with the current skylines <coughs> with the current elevations of the building nearby buildings so these <coughs> so for that purpose also bim helps you out with respect uh, bim and geospatial will help so again depending upon the level of details you can see each and every aspects of that particular building model and how it is going to look with <clears throat> your environment which is in and around that particular building that you have designed so these are some of the uh, use cases where bim and geospatial together can give you the information which is not available only through geospatial or only through bim or building information model <clears throat> so why again we'll just talk about this question of why geospatial and bim so bim actually give you what is planned and geospatial can give you what is as built there on ground so this is again a laser scan data so it will give you of <clears throat> the so now we'll just talk about how this reality capture will help you out so reality capture using laser scanners or lidar data sets along with the cameras can give you the panorama and it can give you the laser scans so these laser scans can help you out in <clears throat> doing all the measurements without going to uh, ground again and again so once you do laser capture or reality capture that particular area you have everything available with you on your computer so again and again you don't need to go you can <coughs> measure it each and every as building each and every window each and every small to the millimeter level accuracy depending upon the laser scanners so this is some of the examples of how the construction was going on and <coughs> using this reality capture we are measuring it the distances the width the column height and all and everything is up to the millimeter level accuracy so whatever has been planned it is going according to the plan or not that can be visualized and checked and <clears throat> these reality capture data also work as a time stamp images for any construction project or any building project so if you are capturing it that is time stamp for that particular area so it can you can always refer it in near future how the building progress has actually completed over the period of time so again you can see <clears throat> these columns are there for flyover so how it is actually going on 
this is a laser scan uh, panoramic data of a bridge that is in Yamuna River. And so <clears throat> along with this uh, panoramic images, you have these laser scans or LIDAR data or point cloud data. Many names are there for that. So that point cloud data uh, basically helps you out in identifying these uh, objects and that will help you out in uh, measurements, different different uh, analysis you want to do regarding area calculation, distance, angles. So all these things you can help do with the help of this <coughs> point cloud data, which is incorporated along with the panoramic images by the reality capture systems. <coughs> and now we talk about uh, so government has a very good scheme called Hridaya, which is for uh, heritage development and uh, redevelopment. So GeoBIM actually plays, can play a very major role in these heritage sites also. In fact, lots of sites of India has been uh, laser scanned, unfortunately, because of the custodian, <coughs> uh, because of the, you know, custody of the data is not with us. So I just cannot show you some of the data of India, but most of the Indian uh, heritage site has been actually laser scanned and and it actually can be used for different purposes. So these laser scan using the UAV or using your terrestrial scan can give you these point cloud data, give you this 3D model structures of any building, any heritage sites and which can be used later on. So I'll just give you one of the example here. <coughs> Uh, why it has been uh, it can actually been helpful so one is redevelopment one is actually it will give you what is available along with that heritage structures and what is there within the vicinity and it can be used in case of any mishappening also so this is one of the laser scan of uh, uh, one of the cathedral in france called uh, notre dame so which has actually caught fire in 2019 so these laser scan actually can help or these <clears throat> panorama image can actually help the persons who are doing the restoration drive. So if you see here, after uh, once the fire was there, fire broke out, the this category was damaged and the estimated time for restoration was five to six years. So, but <clears throat> if you want to restore it, you also need some detailed diagrams, detailed pictures of for the restoration purposes. So for that, actually, these panoramic images, these reality, cap reality capture data that has been captured and in 2010 uh, somebody has actually uh, captured uh, this cathedral and this data was available with him so which is used by the people who are doing for the restoration drive so <clears throat> so heritage reconstruction or restoration or redevelopment so geobim and actually plays a very very big role in these particular uh, schemes and our government is actually already going with the scheme called Hirde, as I mentioned. So all the heritage site will be laser scanned and reality captured and the 3D model of each and every heritage site will be available soon. And if any mishap, which I hope doesn't happen, we can always restore and using these data kind of different kind of data sets. So these are some of the examples that uh, I just wanted to showcase and use case uh, of geospatial and beam integration and i just want to thank you and i just uh, feel honored to be presenting this in front of uh, all of you so thank you very much so if there is any question we can just go ahead with that please thank you thank you so much sir that was very informative and i think the audience has a lot to take away from these talks so we can now proceed with the question and answer session. So um, uh, we have expert Dr. V. R. Hidde and Mr. Sumit Sapa with us. So first question, please. Don't have a question. I think uh, I was very lucid and then very good. If you have questions, let's speak. So one question. Uh, this Daniel City, how much of it is uh, 3D model uh, or geospatial? I mean, is or if at all it is available, I mean, is it available with documents so that we can have an access to that data? 
this, this is great. I mean, like going forward, there's no question about that. I mean, it will have to depend on the geospatial and 3D. Especially when it uh, comes to you know, managing and maintaining large scale projects. Okay. Uh, as such, you know, uh, Bangalore Mahanagar Palike, Lower Bangalore, BBMP, or its uh, 710 square kilometer area, it has every row, every row, then then uh, census data, of course, then I would add in it, but uh, road data you can always predict from that as an academic institution within the Bangalore. And then later, see, this is how uh, academic student research institute builds in the process of data. Okay, I can share my 1995 data, which was I did for my you know, structure plan for Bangalore. But later, what I did is on my own, I have developed a lot of data, but I use as a consulting value addition. For BBMP, we have used a lot of other data. Now it becomes very different. It's available. What do you think? See, what happens? Our systems, they say that you know it's confidential, nothing. Nothing is confidential. That is geospatial data, and you don't have any strategic locations like atomic centers. But they may not give you resource centers and then airport or the central earlier airport. But rest of the data should be available. But BD data would not be available in India because nobody would have captured it in 3D. But you have an opportunity as a research principal academic institution, MRSC provides 2.5 meter multi spectral satellite data from Cartosai and 0.36 meter uh, resolution data on the uh, Cartosai spectrometry. Merging that, you can produce. 0.5 meter effective spatial data, which is like Google, what you see. As a research institution, we have come to get very subsidized data. Okay, where which if I buy, I'd love to pay around 2 lakh, 2.3 or 3 lakh. If you go and then buy general data, and then we can build up your own institution here. Point, uh, 3 6 meter or uh, effective 0.5 meter data is wonderful. It is better than Google, what you get today. That way you can slowly build down so that for you know the batches by batches, students get used to working on the practical or the real time data. And then that could be taken as option for different different concepts of your teaching and then output. You can develop a digital library of data here itself. Then you get it but better do it yourself. No, understood, but is it available in 3D? Like, have you know, they consulted you to, you know, uh, model the entire city in 3D? Yeah, if you, if you get, that's what I tell you, Cartosat data, then digital elevation model, you can do that. But nobody, see, now things are slowly happening. I brought in the concept of census block integrated for population estimation for individual location, building the world model. As a consultant, I have to give a population justification for a locality. How do I do that? I know the census operation looks for 100 to 150 houses in a map area. They'll map it and then go there in a month, enumerate the numbers. That map is there with them as a child registry. Because I was working with census for some other work somewhere, sometime back, I know that they have this data. This is not going to many people. So that we brought it. Your reference with the roads and then everything. Now your take is ready, you can cut it the way you like what is. That's how you start digging. Okay, you may, in your uh, case, then your spatial data, it is available, you know, now don't worry about developing your own data unless until you need it some, for something. Take uh, the open street map data. Build on it on your own. See, you may be um, teaching the UAE the data collection methods or hire a UAE. It's question of a couple of hours or uh, days job to play. Get 3D, get point cloud, get the you know, the author rectifier, then do whatever analysis you need. It hardly you know, gets any worse. But it's a wonderful data input for batches of batches to me. I would rather recommend. 
going to the government or any other agency getting the data, any way this is borrowed data. Whatever intrinsic error you have, you want to multiply it. Rather, do it yourself. You will get a very subsidized rate, I tell you. Because a couple of days back, only we have ordered for Bengaluru City, BBMP area for some other work. Same panchromatic and uh, multispectral cartostat, the latest cartostat, which I am getting for 35,000. You also can get it for 35,000. And entire Bengaluru City. And then take a long measure of corridor. Keep watching what is happening. After that, only last one and a half year is up. Before that, you will not get the that much of details. Because I wanted to see monitoring the Michael's uh, you know, work. It was not possible. I wanted to have a September case, which other data we collected, the plus year. Okay? I could not get I did do a lot of other estimation, but not the able data. Then I had to go for synthetic aperture radar, micro sensor, which can flash through the cloud. Okay, and we built in integrate so many things and do it. Probably, yet, uh, whenever you require some sort of assistance, we are always there. Thank you, Swan. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for both of the resource persons. Uh, we are involved in 2019. In establishing this, you know the difficulties, initial attractions and frustrations, not getting the data. It's a long way to go. And uh, in that run, we request your help in building up that solution. So, uh, one, this is just an opinion. Uh, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of time you have to invest with the system. And also procuring the software and different amalgamating and to judge it. I, my feel is the field experience matters. Initially, the students get into it. Any three points you give, it gives some math, but it will be ironic. So that is where your judgment comes into matter because the students are here. There will be a lot of initial attraction and there's definitely going to be a frustration because of the data availability, but you need to spend time. That's what uh, my feeling. I know uh, both of your uh, tremendous experience in the field where you are coming from. Thank you. Thank you. See, one thing you know, people should not feel uh, dearth of data in, in this current scenario. Now, where you feel that I can generate, go ahead, you have every data possible. That's what I tell you. For example, sentinel data, of course, not at the level of accuracy you're looking at. It's a 10 meter spatial data, where it's freely available. Even uh, processing platform is free. Snap, you go to the ESSI, Copernicus, you get into that, you have data freely available. I'm using the uh, free data for so many analysis. We download, and then of course, the software license part of it. Uh, of course, uh, I have been in the private sector, but I'm not uh, selling any software licenses. But I recommend, I was also commercial, I used it commercially available property software for three decades. Now, last one decade, I tell you, I'm into open source. You don't have to bother. GIS, QGIS, or any other open source software, you go ahead. You have tremendous possibilities of plugins available. And I have done it, my, my very much junior most colleague. Last year, she completed her MTech in uh, geoinformatics. Got her interview and then uh, brought it to our you know, group. Pressurize and sit down, make her to understand. Now she has started developing plugins for QGIS. Now there are three plugins for QGIS. One of them you have seen there, the fault tracing on uh, what the line lines. There is no perhaps. It happens. But don't tell me that when you have to go wrong, it should be corrected. It can be corrected. People should not think that, okay, my map is not coming right. Don't worry at all. You have, but start with building data on OpenStreetMap or get the Google data downloaded and start putting the CAD whatever line onto that. See what you are getting data. Test it, test it, then go ahead. Maybe a practical session on using the, you know, free open source data, how to use it and all that could be done. But basically, since you are interested in developing the GIS, uh, you know, as a 
Two thousand one more thing I tell you. We are not getting adequate space adequately placed the resources for the industry. That's a constraint I have. I need to put in minimum six to eight months of my effort, making them to be useful for my analysis. For example, I tell you, sir, a lot of civil engineering people come down. I ask them how much they remember. Difference, you know, because our is a consulting project. Basically, we are obliged to produce results. Hydrology, and they don't understand. In is called CI only they know. The problem is that when I talk about architecture, the building, you know, they know only drafting. You ask them positionally because we have so much of software today, laser software in a mobile. You go there in a room and then scan it. It can bring a 3D picture to you, to your lab. They know how to make WhatsApp and all those things, but not this. But it happens, but the culture can be created. They have no culture. Only thing you have to orient them. Data companies are you will have open source data is available. And then, um, of course, only municipal data you will not require. Don't get into that. For example, last year, one of the MT students in the uh, construction, he had come to me for uh, master's degree. I said, you have come to a wrong person. He wanted to do MTech, uh, no, internship. I don't know who has said. He came to my office and said, I want to do. I said, I'm into the GIS remote sensing consultancy. He was just MTech in civil engineering, particularly also construction management. Your professor should not call me, sir, tomorrow. Sir, I want to do something. Then I only told him, made him to work on one of the high-rise buildings in Bangalore City. At all honest. You know, linkage. 1990, there was no high rise building except for Vichetera Tower and then uh, one utility building and then we went on tracing the Google. You know, last year 2021, during the during the corona, we have 4,000 plus high rise buildings which are more than 20 stories and distribution pattern get done. Then I told you correlate with the structure load, building density, and then the you know anything other two related to construction and things. Was I at? Because I was in the geospatial domain, and the engineer comes to me asking for a project to go. He wants to be guided. What else I could have done? And one more person came. I am trying to plot queries. Construction material for everybody in the civil engineering, granite of Bangalore is simple one and the same. I know as a material person, person, the organist working on the parts, micrograin or microplane, and then its composition. Eastern part of Bangalore is different from central part of Bangalore, and then the western part. And if you go towards Western Gata, that's different. And larva is different. Do we know? Ask them to do that for you, go there and they get that and then bring the hand specimen. I'll tell you what it is. Then you can go and then test it. Cutting strength may be seen. But when you take it to mixture, concrete mixture, silica content becomes important. And then magnesium and then calcium. This part people tend to do it. So I thought basic from this, you try to do because we have only one and a half months time. The pressure of academics, you know, the exams and everything. Last minute they come. It always happens. Uh, as Smitha was saying that uh, we can make a uh, model trigger out of the link uh, meta. Uh, so I want to know if this is parametric uh, designs could be made with the thing as well as the climatic factors. Can these be analyzed through the software? Um, Mr. Thapa, you want to take this question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, sir. But uh, I just uh, missed the question in between. Actually, Weiss was a little bit interrupted in between, maybe because of the network. I'm sorry <laughs> if you could please repeat that question. Yeah. 
Yeah, if there are no more questions, it's my time to say thank you very much. Thank you, ABI, my association. And then in the Craig University, and particularly you, ma'am, and in the department. It's a good atmosphere and a good occasion for me. I felt when I entered, as I told you in the beginning, as if I'm entering my alma mater campus in Karnataka University, Dhabla, University campus. It used to be giving a wonderful feeling. But almost we missed today because of the, the commercial life or whatever we are into. But that's what you know. I would be very happy if one of you could pursue, or as a department, into the GIS database at a very large scale, one is to one thousand scale. Start building today. One day it will be useful for renovation or whatever it is. Maybe you may be teaching UAVs, data products, and everything. You now flying drone is about this area. Is one day job. Okay. Which cannot cost you more than 40, 50,000. And then simply get the data. I'll tell you, we'll tell you how to process, how to use, and how to extract data and go ahead. Wonderful input you have. Maybe you can start with building the, you know, uh, so we, now we have moved into campus very recently. Earlier, it was in old data. It may not be feasible now. I have told incidentally, Google was giving to us. I could see one or two. 1995, it was not there. I think 2000 onwards, whatever I could get, I get showed to you. It, it happened coincidentally. Since I got the location of this particular location to come down, I got interested. Suddenly, I looked into the historical data, I got it. Otherwise, you know, I was still in 1994. I was only planning here for building this area. It was a town kit. Alternative, you know, decondition of Bangalore started thinking in 1994. I was part of the team, our team, team leader for that. Uh, we haven't had uh, anything like that. We had 20,000 hectares of land was identified as township here, including this land. Okay, within the hall of in between. And then later it became, uh, because expressway came, we, a redesign happened, it became a just a township. Especially because I know I have been incidentally, you know, uh, working on this, I have some stories. I don't know if you know You can come, you can build it. I said, part of uh, you know, the school of architecture or whatever, we have lab is building. Wonderful thing. And one more thing same flight data. Madam, I tell you only one second. Same drone. Ask him to, if at all you fly, ask him to one of the buildings with a 70 degree, 80 degree, or 60 degree inclined flight. Which is feasible, which we do normally. You have got wonderful data, 3D, then you can get into any beam model. I'm experimenting with all the things of like this, which we have been successful. Okay, and rebuild, re engineer it, and you learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for the good opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crest University and AGI for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. With that, we reach the end of our seminar. I would like to propose the vote of thanks. I thank Christ University Management for providing such a platform and inviting eminent speaker for today's session. 
I thank the AGR group for their proactive work in the field of geospatial technologies and for coming to our campus to disseminate the students about the same. I thank our esteemed speakers, Dr. Vyar Hegde and Mr. Sunil Thapa, for sparing some time from their busy schedules and sharing their valuable knowledge and expertise with us. I thank the heads of the department, Dr. Aninda Sushilan and Dr. Raghunandan Kumar, for their guidance in organizing this event. The faculty coordinators, Professor Jyoti Gupta from School of Architecture and Professor Shibu from Civil Department for their support. Last but not the least, the audience for being the great spectators today. Thank you all so much. This is Nishita Ayush. Uh, Ma'am, with the students, I, I request all the faculty and the students to come.